Welcome back to the 21 Convention 2020 of Orlando, Florida, being held for the first time ever at our very first and inaugural 21 Summit event. Our next speaker is the founder of Strong, uh, Strength Camp, CEO of Strength Camp. He has over 2 million YouTube subscribers, and he's spoken twice previously at the 21 Convention and the 21 Convention First Patriarch Edition held last year in Orlando, Florida. He's a proud patriarch of four, and I think one of the best speakers we've ever had at this convention in our entire 14-year history. Without further ado, please let me welcome back to the 21 Convention stage, Elliot Hulse! Thanks for joining us. Anthony, thank you for putting on this awesome event. Really excited to share with you guys today. This is actually the first of three talks I'll be giving this weekend. Each talk builds on top of the previous talk. This talk, I lay the foundation for the next two talks, and I've got a lot of references. So I'll be reading for a good portion of it. Next. Introduction. Men today are weak. The following is a transcript of supporting facts I've gleaned from a 2018 report, report by Tucker Carlson titled Men in America. If you're a middle-aged man, you know at least one peer who has killed themselves in recent years. If you're a parent, you may have noticed that your daughters and their friends seem a little bit more on the ball than your sons. They get better grades. They smoke much less marijuana. They spend less time playing video games. They go to more prestigious colleges. If you're an employer, you may have noticed that your female employees show up on time. The young men don't. Of course, if you live in this country, you've seen a horrifying series of mass shootings, far more than we ever have. Women didn't do that. In every case, the man, the shooter, was a man. Something ominous is happening to men in America. Anyone who pays attention knows that. But it's odd how rarely you hear it publicly acknowledged. Our leaders pledge to create more opportunities for girls and women, but men don't need help. They're the patriarchy. They're fine. More than fine. Are they fine? Here are the numbers. Let's start with the most basic, life and death. American men will die on average five years before average American women. One of the reasons for this is addiction. Men are more than twice as likely as women to become alcoholics. They are also twice as likely to die of a drug overdose. In New Hampshire, one of the state's hardest hit by the opioid crisis, 73% of over overdose deaths were men. The saddest re reason for shortness of life in men is suicide. 77% of all suicides in America are committed by men, and the overall rate is increasing at a dramatic rate. Between 1997 and 2014, there was a 43% rise in suicide deaths amongst middle-aged American men. The highest rates are among American Indians and white men, who kill themselves at about 10 times the rate of Hispanic and black men. You often hear about America's incarceration crisis. That's almost exclusively a male problem, too. About 98% of inmates are men. These problems are complex, but we do know that they start young. Relative to girls, boys are failing in school. More girls graduate high school and from college. In schools at every level, boys account for the overwhelming majority of discipline cases. Fully one in five high school boys have been diagnosed with some form of hyperactivity disorder. That's compared with just one in 11 girls. Many of them are medicated for it. The long-term health effects of these medications are not fully understood, but they do appear to include depression later in life. More women go to graduate school. They earn the majority of doctoral degrees. They are also the majority of new enrollees in both law and medical school. For men, the consequences of failing in school are long-term and profound. Between 1979 and 2010, working-aged men with only a high school degree saw their real hourly wages drop about 20%. Over the same period of time, high school educated women saw their wages rise. The decline of the industrial economy disproportionately hurt men. There are now 7 million working age men in America who do not work. They dropped out of the labor force. Nearly half of them take pain medication 
on any given day. That's the highest rate in the world by far. Far fewer young men get married than just a few decades ago, and far fewer stay married. About one in five American children now live only with their mothers. That's double the rate of the 1970s. Millions of boys are growing up without fathers. Young adult men are more likely to live with a parent than they are to live with a spouse or a partner. That is not the case for young women. Single women buy their own homes at more than twice the rate of single men. More women have driver's license. Whenever gender differences come up in public debates, the wage gap comes up. A woman makes 70, 70 cents for every dollar a man earns. That's the statistic you'll hear a lot. Presidents have repeated it, and many candidates. It's everywhere. That number compares all American men to all American women across all professions. No legitimate social scientist would consider that a valid or meaningful measure. The number does not mean anything. It's intentionally misleading. It's a talking point. Once you compare men and women with similar experience, working the same hours and similar jobs for the same period, because that's the only way to measure it, the gap disappears. In fact, it may invert. One study using census data concludes that single women in their 20s living in metropolitan areas now earn 8% more on average than their male counterparts. By the way, the majority of managers in the workplace are women. Women on average are scoring higher on their IQ tests than men. Even physically, men are falling behind. A recent study found that half of young men fail the Army's entry-level physical fitness exam during basic training. Fully 70% of American men are now overweight or obese, as compared to 59% of American women. Perhaps most terrifying, men are becoming less male fundamentally, measurably. Sperm counts across the West have plummeted. They're down almost 60% since the 1970s. Scientists don't know why. Testosterone levels in men have fallen precipitously. One study found that the average levels of male testosterone drop 1% every year since 1987, and that's not related to age. In other words, the average 40-year-old man in 2017 would have testosterone levels 30% lower than the average 40-year-old man in 1987. There's no upside to this trend. Lower testosterone means, uh, lower testosterone in men is associated with depression, lethargy, weight gain, and decreased cognitive ability. Nothing like this has ever happened to a population before. What is going on and how can we fix it? So there's no question, in every single way, as explained here, men are weak today. I'm weaker than my daddy was, you're weaker than your dad, than your granddad. In each generation, we just keep getting weaker. It's not a judgment, these are facts. We are not doing well at all, and according to what I just read here from Tucker Carlson, women are doing a whole lot better than we are. Next. So I'm here to point some things out and clear up some facts and let you know that it's not all our fault. I'm not saying we shouldn't take responsibility for various areas of our lives, but there are a lot of things going on behind the scenes that we're not being told and we're not very clear about. So in my three-part series, beginning today, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about the hidden reasons for weakness in men. That's today's talk. Got a lot of resources for that. Tomorrow I'll be talking about exposing the dark mother for the 22 convention, as it relates, and returning to the father for the patriarch edition on Saturday. Next. The hidden reasons for weakness in men. Next. Today, we're going to go through these three chapters. Number one, the predictable pattern of male effeminacy. There's a pattern of effeminacy that is built into our DNA. I'm going to talk about that. The cultural, collapse, the cultural causes of collapse for masculinity today. And then number three, feminism and the rise of the nice guy. Next. The predictable pattern of fe male effeminacy. Next. What exactly is meant by 
effeminacy in men. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, effeminacy is defined by St. Thomas Aquinas as an unwillingness to put aside one's pleasure in order to pursue what is arduous or difficult. Sloth has the same definition. What's the difference? Sloth is an aversion to what's hard. With effeminacy, it's attachment to pleasure. And I'm going to assert that there is an epidemic of effeminacy uh, here in America and in the West. Next. According to, uh, they're supposed to all show up there, but they're not. Uh, as expanded upon by fa uh, Father Chad Ripperger, there are four kinds of effeminacy. Whoop, there they are. Number one, sensual effeminacy. This is following our lower appetites, sensation over reason. Some examples include sex addiction, masturbation, sleeping in, overeating, playing video games, getting drunk, using drugs. Number two, we have emotional effeminacy, following our emotions, Feelings over reason. Examples include moodiness, mood swings, addiction to excitement and passion, good feelings, inflation, etc. Next, we have uh, intellectual effeminacy. Various examples of, uh, or intellectual effeminacy is actually seeking novelty, mental masturbation over resting in the truth. Examples of that are overthinking overconsumption of books, videos, media, addiction to argument, dissatisfaction with intellectual calm. You see a lot of this in Facebook comments. Number four, volitional effeminacy. Egoism, pride, personal will over the will of God. Examples include overworking, narcissism, doing what you want rather than doing what's right and an unwillingness to sacrifice. Effeminacy in men. Next. So there's a predictable pattern of male effeminacy. And I'm going to be talking a whole lot about that in the next few slides. And it can be seen here in what's referred to as the masculinity cycle. This model can be imposed upon a single man's evolution, his own life, uh, or it could be superimposed upon the collective experience. Starting at the top, hard times create strong men. Shout out to Stefan Arnio, may he rest in peace. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And then weak men create hard times. And I assert that we are sort of in the middle there between good times, creating weak men. I mean, like, we we're totally there. We already asserted it. The numbers prove it. I just laid it out there for you. Men are weak. We're getting weaker. Our testosterone man juice is dropping, and uh, in many ways, we're, we're turning into women. I'll show you more. Uh, and so these good times are coming to an end if you're starting to pay attention. And it's not a matter of being a doomsdayer or uh, be having a negative outlook on things. This is a normal, natural, very repeatable, often happens, always happens pattern where these good times that create weak men create a situation where weak men create hard times. And we're like right at the precipice of that. And I'm going to show you a whole lot more here today to sort of hammer home that point. Next. So uh, this idea is really depicted very well in Will Durant's famous quote, a nation is born stoic and dies Epicurean. At its cradle, religion stands and philosophy accompanies it to the grave. In the beginning of all cultures, a strong religious faith conceals and softens the nature of things and gives men courage to bear pain and hardship patiently. At every step, the gods are with them and will not let them perish until they do. Even a firm faith will explain that it was the sins of the people that turn their gods to an avenging wrath. Evil does not destroy faith, but strengthens it. If victory comes, if war is forgotten, and security and peace, then wealth grows. The life of the body gives way in the dominant classes to the life of the senses and the mind. Toil and suffering are replaced by pleasure and ease. 
Science weakens faith even while thought and comfort weaken virility and fortitude. At last, men begin to doubt the gods. They mourn the tragedy of knowledge and seek refuge in every passing delight. Achilles at the beginning, Epicurus at the end. After David comes Job, and after Job, Ecclesiastes. Historically, we can see good times creating weak men playing out perfectly in next. American degeneracy, next. Roman decadence, next. The Bible and Babylon. And if you take a look at the Old Testament, it is simply a story of mankind doing this. Getting, getting saved, screwing it up, destroying themselves. And just over and over and over again, the story uh, or the image that you see there is from Revelations, which describes what it looks like when a society is about to go to shit. It's a drunk woman dr <laughs> riding on a wild animal. And if you think about that, if you just take that imagery and you and superimpose it upon what's going on today, a drunk woman riding an animal. Yeah, we're there. Next. And in the beginning. So what I'd like to do here is I'm going to read Genesis, the origin story, or the, the origin story from the Bible. And I want, you to, I want you to see if you recognize this pattern. So I want you to, I want you to see how that we're not only dealing with this today, and it wasn't only a Roman problem, this has been a problem since day one. Our ancestor, first man, Genesis chapter one. God says, let's make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move on the ground. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. God saw all he had made, and it was good. Chapter 2. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall asleep, and while sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place of his flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of Adam and brought the woman to Adam. Chapter 3. Now the serpent was the most crafty than any other wild animal in the Lord God, that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from fruit from the trees of the garden, but God said you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree, that was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and was also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it, then also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of Lord God as he was walking through the garden on a cool day, and they hid from him among the trees. But the Lord God said to the man, Where are you? The man answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave it to me, and I ate some of the fruit. <laughs> then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And in the final act... To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you not to, 
Cursed is the ground upon which you walk. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you are taken, for dust you are, and dust you will return. So there you have it, Adam acting real effeminate. We see that things were okay. Things were developing. Think about the developing world. Things are getting, they're, they're difficult, but we're figuring shit out. Things are getting a little bit better. Then we need a little entertainment. Along came the woman. Then evil sneaks in. You can have power. Power corrupts. Then shit hits the fan. And what does Adam do? He blames his wife. He doesn't even take responsibility for what happened. He doesn't even say, man, let me, let me just take this in the chin. Let me just be a man about this. Let me take responsibility. I screwed up. No, he blames God and then blames the woman. He's totally freaking effeminate. So here you can see the masculinity cycle take place in the garden. But most poignantly, you see Adam, the first man, displaying a tremendous amount of effeminacy. Sensual effeminacy, he took pleasure in the apple. Emotional, following his feelings over reason. Some of the fathers say that he wanted to be with his wife more than he wanted to be with God. Which one? Intellectual, his pride in gaining forbidden knowledge. There's a reason why God didn't want him to know the things that ultimately corrupted him and us. And volitional, following his own will over, following uh, his own will, but even worse, he follows the will of his wife and then blames her and takes no responsibility. Often we want to blame Eve, but in fact, Adam was the first offender. He did not protect the garden from evil, thus his wife was seduced. So it's very evident that there's a predictable pattern of effeminacy in men. This is nothing new, which stretches all the way back to the first man, Adam. So there we have it. That's one reason why it's not your fault, right? And you can't blame these guys. It's just a part of our nature, it seems. Next. So in chapter two, we're going to discuss the cultural causes of collapsed masculinity. Next. So ideological subversion, our great brainwashing. This is a KGB defector by the name of Yuri Benzinov. Uh, he's one of the world's outstanding ex experts on the subject of Soviet propaganda and disinformation and active measures. In 1984, he gave this interview where he states, ideological subversion is the slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures in the language of the KGB or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, or their country. It is a great brainwashing process which goes very slow and is divided into four basic stages. The first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 30 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years required to educate one generation of students in the country of your enemy. In other words, Marxism, Leninism, Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of at least three generations of American students. From another interview, he expands on demoralization, because this is key. We're totally in this demoralized state. This is the process which can take about 15 to 30 years to perform. During this stage, the moral fiber and integrity of the country is put into question, thereby creating doubts in the minds of the people. To do so, manipulation of the media and academia is required to influence young people. As the younger generation embraces new values, such as Marxism and Leninism, the older generation slowly loses control simply through attrition. Again, true facts no longer matter during this stage, but rather creating perceptions are paramount. He continues, without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism, 
The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already for 25 years. And this was 1983. Actually, it's overfulfilled because demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not all the experts would have dreamed of. It's been such a tremendous success because most of it's done by Americans to Americans thanks to a lack of moral standards, as I mentioned before. Exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Even if I show him information, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures. Even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camps, he will refuse to believe it until he receives a kick in his fat bottom. When a military boot crushes his balls, then he will understand, but not before. That is the tragic situation of demoralization. In order to better understand who and why this demoralization has taken place to such a great extent that we have an epidemic of effeminate men in America and the West. First, we'll take a look at the history and the philosophy of Marxism-Leninism. Next. The philosophy of Marxism-Leninism originated as the proactive political praxis of the Bolshevik faction of the Russian Socialist Democratic Labor Party in realizing political change in Tsarist Russia. Leninism allowed the Bolshevik party to assume command in the October Revolution in 1917. For the next few slides, I will be uh, referencing Spreading the Errors of Russia, a YouTube video by Census Fidelium. Marxist theory taught that when a great war finally broke out between the nations, the working classes would unite and overthrow the governments. Because according to Marxist theory, the workers of the world have much more in common with each other than they do with the bourgeoisie or the ruling class in their own countries. But when World War I broke out, the workers of the world did not unite with one another. They fought each other. The British working men fought Great Britain. The French working men fought France. The German working men fought for Germany, and so forth. Not surprisingly, it turned out that any given working man was more loyal to his country than he was to the counterparts from other countries. From a Marxist perspective then, World War I was a colossal flop. In 1917, the Marxists finally seized power in Russia. It looked like the theory was working, but it did not spread after the war. So a series of attempts were made to spread the revolution. There was a briefly lived Soviet Republic of Bavaria that held power for six months in 1918. In 1919, the communist uprising in, in Berlin. In 1919, the Soviet Republic of Hungary, which held up for 133 days. But once again, the workers didn't support these. So the Marxist regimes were quickly closed. Something was wrong. Marxism had a problem. It wasn't working. So what to do? Next. Cultural Marxism. Independently, two Marxist theories, theorists, George Lucas of Hungary and Antonio Gramsci of Italy, came up with the same solutions and are credited with being the fathers of Western version of Marxism. It's called cultural Marxism. They both taught that communism was impossible in the West until both Western civilization and Christianity were destroyed, since they blinded the working class to its true Marxist intents. George Lucas recognized the great obstacle to the creation of a Marxist regime was Western civilization itself. He said, I can see revolution and destruction of society as the only solution for a worldwide overturning of values. We ca this cannot take place without the annihilation of the old values and the creation of new ones. So there in a nutshell, we have the agenda of, of cultural Marxism uh, explained by one of its creators, George Lucas. Antonio Gramsci, the other creator of cultural Marxism, argued that the West would have to be de-Christianized by means of what he entitled the long march to the institutions. What he meant by this was that the culture must be the new battleground and that all the barriers to the acceptance of Marxism must be removed or reconfigured according to Marxist principles. All cultural barriers to accept Marxism should be reconfigured starting with the family, i.e., perverting gender roles, removing the rule of the father. 
going through the churches, the arts, cinema, theater, literature, science, history, entertainment, schools, colleges, universities, seminaries, civic organizations, the organs of mass media, newspapers, newspaper, uh, magazines, radio, television, and so forth. We're there. Next. So what basically happened? How did we go from a theory, a Marxist theory in Germany, in Europe, to what we've got today, uh, which is a nation of emasculated, uh, emasculated, effeminate men? So what happened? Basically, we've forgotten or have been demoralized to such an extent that we've forgotten who we are. Our common principles, even the things as basic as what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman, are completely lost. That's how perverted we've become. That's how demoralized we've become through this ideological subversion that most of us don't even know what's going on. And there's a lot of people that support this and love this shit. Quoting the great historian Christopher Dawson, who reflected on the consequences if society to lose its common principles and ideals. This is what would happen. It is easy enough for an individual to adopt a negative attitude of crit or critical skepticism, but if the society as a whole abandons all positive beliefs, and it's it becomes powerless to resist the de integrating, disintegrating effects of selfishness and private interest. Every society rests in the last person on the recognition of common principles and common ideals, and if it makes no moral or spiritual appeal to the loyalty of its members, it must inevitably fall to pieces. So here we are watching what little remains of Western civilization and masculinity completely falling to pieces, or more accurately, being smashed to pieces, which is the explicit goal of co cultural Marxism. It's working, it's working real well. So a deeper question is, how do we move from Marxist theory in Germany to a total annihilation of American and uh, Western masculinity? How did we get here? Next. Now this rabbit hole goes very deep. This is a lot of information. Since time is short, we're going to focus for just a moment on the Frankfurt School. George Lucas, we mentioned before, played an important role in the founding of the Frankfurt School in Germany. The school was founded in 1923 with a primary goal of translating Marxism from economic terms and political terms into cultural terms. The, Frank the Frankfurt School may have turned out to be a little more than a historical oddity had Hitler not come to power in 1933. Given that every member was not only a Marxist but also Jewish, they fled Germany with the help of Columbia University. The school reestablished itself in New York City, at which point they shifted their focus from destroying traditional Western culture in Germany to destroying it in the United States. They believe there are two kinds of revolutions, political and cultural. They kept their focus on the cultural revolution. One of its members comments, one can rightly speak of a cultural revolution, since the protest is directed towards the whole cultural establishment, including the morality of existing society. There is one thing we can say with complete assurance. The traditional idea of revolution, the traditional strategy of revolution, has ended. The ideas are old-fashioned. What we must undertake is a type of diffuse and disparate disintegration of the system. With reference to the system, meaning patriarchy, church, patriotism, country, and paternity, father, and family, all derived from the root word pater, meaning pattern, uh, meaning father. If you want to destroy a culture, you take out the father, the pater, its root pattern. They also recognized that the working class in America was not going to lead a Marxist revolution because it was becoming a part of the middle class. America was doing great. We had no beef, nobody. Uh, becoming a part of the middle class or the bourgeoisie, the great middle class, class in America. Who then would lead a revolution in the 1950s? Herbert Marcuse answers, the coalition will be made up of blacks, students, feminist women, and homosexuals. 
By crossing Marx with Freud, they invented something called critical theory. Today you hear it called critical race theory. Critical theory involves making the most destructive criticisms of every possible cultural norm in order to destroy the current social order. That's its purpose, as is Marxism. For example, anyone who is successful or holds a position of power is labeled as an oppressor. Those who are not successful are victims. Also, someone who defends the notion that there's actually different social roles for women and men, they're a male chauvinist or misogynist. Strong men, alpha males, fathers are the patriarchy, they're tyrants, and so on. Over time, their influential writings continued to pour out contempt on the different institutions, the traditional family, the churches, the arts, cinema, theater, literature, science, history, it's everywhere. In institutions of so-called higher education, cultural Marxism was more commonly known as multiculturalism and more loosely known as political correctness. And this is where we are. The Frankfurt School also adopted techniques of psychological conditioning. Today, for example, if the foot soldiers want to do something like normalize transsexuality, they don't argue the point philosophically. They just make Bruce Jenner into a woman, next, and put him on the cover of Vanity Fair magazine and call you a racist if you don't agree. Woman of the year. To note that, the Frankfurt School uh, men, the men that created the Frankfurt School, spent the war years in Hollywood. If you think Hollywood is not totally corrupt, think again. Next. Timothy Matthews in The Conspiracy to Corrupt summarizes specific recommendations of the Frankfurt School. Number one, the creation of racism offenses. You gotta turn people against each other. Continual change to create confusion. How many genders are there? The teaching of sex and homosexuality to children. I saw uh, one of my students sent me a pamphlet of sorts that they're using in schools teaching children how to have butt sex. Uh, the undermining of schools, teachers, and authority. Everybody is a revolutionary. Everybody hates authority. Everybody thinks they're a rebel, that it's laughable at this point. Huge immigration to destroy identity. There's a reason why. The promotion of excessive drinking to destroy our bodies, to effeminate men. Uh, empty of churches, emptying of churches, because churches represent the patriarchy represent pattern, represent authority, represent, represent uh, an important part of what builds Western civilization. You've got to destroy it. And the church today is totally effeminate. In every regard, it's an apostate. Uh, unreliable legal system, dependency on the state and state benefits, control and dumbing down the media, encouraging the breakdown of the family. I mean, which one of these hasn't uh, totally taking grip in our culture. None of them, we're there. So uh, given that our focus today is on the degeneration and degradation of masculinity, I highlighted number 11, encouraging the breakdown of the family, because this is what we're focusing on here, why men are effeminate, what the hell is going on. Next. We'll take special note of their plan, the cultural Marxist plan to encourage the breakdown of the family since fatherless boys are extremely affected by the degenerate culture. There's no question about it, and I'll show you more. One of the main ideas of the Frankfurt School was to exploit Freud's idea of pansexualism, the search for pleasure, the exploitation of the differences between the sexes, the overthrowing of traditional relationships between men and women. To further their aims, they would attack the authority of the father, deny the specific roles of father and mother, mother, rest away from the families, their right as primary educators of their children, abolish differences in education of boys and girls, abolish all forms of male dominance, hence the presence of women in the armed forces, declare women to be an oppressed class and men to be oppressors. Next. Satan's plan from the beginning. So let's return for a moment to the garden. What we're dealing here with is a spiritual battle, and it was Satan's plan from the beginning in the first book of Enoch, chapter 69, which describes how the fallen angels came to earth. 
And the third was named Gadriel. This is the one that showed all the deadly blows to the sons of man. And he led astray Eve. And he showed the weapons of death to the children of men, the shield and the breastplate, and the sword for slaughter, and all the weapons of death to the sons of men. In the Garden of Eden, there were many trees, but only one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that was forbidden by Yah, or God. In the beginning was the truth and the warning against false doctrine from the father of lies. From this tree comes everything within our fallen world. The lie told in the Garden of Eden is the same lie being told today. The tree of knowledge represents false doctrine. This is also the tree of knowledge in Jewish mysticism, or Kabbalah, which is the foundation for esoteric Freemasonry. Some people associate this with the Illuminati, or the deep state, or shadow governments, or what some people are calling the Kabbal. If you look closely enough, you might see a connection between Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah, Freemasonry, the occult, Marxism, communists, and the culture of death. That's a rabbit hole you can choose to go down on your own time. If you're so inclined, I'd be happy to discuss, with it, uh, discuss, you, discuss it with you later if you'd like. But one thing is for sure, next, communism is from hell. <laughs> communism is the end game of Marxism. And Gadriel from the kingdom of Satan is the one who showed the weapons of death to the children of men. This is false doctrine desi designed to destroy us since the beginning. Here you see how over 100 million people have been killed, have died over the past 100 years uh, in countries that have adopted communism. And make no question about it, we're headed down this path. 2020 is a monumental year. We, had a, we got a crazy election coming up. And it's going to weigh heavily on whether we keep edging in this direction towards Satan's plan for cultural Marxism to continue to brainwash and destroy us and the inevitable unfolding of the plan to turn the world into one world communist society. And you gotta take down America. America represents the father in the world, the leader in the world, the strong man in the world. And a big part of the reason why we're so hated and Donald Trump is so hated is because you can't have that. You can't have strong men if you want a world that will yield to the blows of Satan. And, you know, we got a lot of countries that have done it. We might be next. Next. Feminism is also from hell. And uh, referring to Gadriel, and he led astray Eve. By the way, Satan is a title it is a description, I'm sorry, not a title. So that there were many fallen angels. And, uh, and so, and he led astray Eve. This is where we are today. Because our focus uh, in this talk is about men becoming weak, we really do need to take a look at feminism and man's reaction to it. Feminism is a child of communism, Marxism, as we alluded to earlier the destruction of the family is paramount to destroy a culture. So what you gotta do is you gotta turn the family against each other, turn the woman against the man, and there here we have it. So um, I'm gonna quote here now from Bob Lewis in The Feminist Lie, where he states, at its most basic level, feminism began as a rebellion against marriage and family values. Early feminists believed that once married, a woman's identity disappeared. To gain sympathy, many early feminists reframed the institution of marriage as a form of slavery. To support their view, they pointed out that women didn't have many rights in society that were given to men. While on the surface this appears to be a complaint, upon closer inspection, it completely falls apart. Next. Uh, and if you're not sure, if, you're, if there's any doubt, here are some quotes about feminism from some women, feminists. The complete destruction of the traditional marriage and the nuclear family is the revolutionary or utopian goal of feminism. Cultural Marxism, it's being fulfilled. Next. How will the family unit be destroyed? The demand 
alone will throw the whole ideology of the family into question so that women can begin establishing a community of work with each other and we can fight collectively. Women will feel freer to leave their husbands, those oppressors, and become economically independent, either through a job or through welfare. The subversion is so complete. Next, the nuclear family must be destroyed. Whatever its ultimate meaning, the breakup of families is now objectively a revolutionary process. Next. Of course, our talk here and my point here is that men are weak. And the idea here is not to point out the dark side of the mother, which is my next talk. Point out the dark side of women. It's to show how the subversion, the overtaking of cultural Marxism, and the move towards communism and its children, atheism and feminism, brings us to the place where we've got these issues. There's no question, fatherlessness makes men weak. All of these are reasons why the things I read from Tucker Carlson earlier are true. There's no doubt that the breakdown of the family and, the fa and fatherlessness contributes greatly to the weakening of men over the last 60 years. The graph on the left shows trends since uh, the 1940s to the 2000s. Now, I know that's hard for you to read, but you don't have to. You can just look at the upward trends there, starting at the top. Birth rates to unmarried mother, all the way to the left, that's the 1940s. All the way to the right, 2000s. Divorce rates, all the way to the left, 1940s, all the way to the right, 2000s. Female head of household, 1940s to the left, 2000s to the right. And then here's the cherry on top. Incarcerated Americans, which are 93% male, 1940s to 2000s. So we see that the breakdown of the family is horrible in multiple different ways, but it is a direct reason why men are in jail, men are suffering, the breakdown of the family. So the one on the right, uh, of course you can't read that, but I want to put it there and I've, I can read it for you here. The graph on the right shares some statistics about fatherlessness. It reads, there is a crisis in America according to the U.S. Census Bureau. 19.7 million children, more than one in four, live without a father in their home. Consequently, there's a father factor in nearly all of societal ills facing America today. Research shows when a child is raised in a father absent home, he or she is affected in the following ways. Four times greater risk of poverty, more likely to have behavioral problems, two times greater risk of infant mortality, more likely to go to prison, more likely to commit a crime, seven times more likely to have teenage pregnancy, more likely to face abuse and neglect, more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, two times more likely to be obese, two more times, two times more likely to drop out of school. Uh, the two times more likely do, to be obese. Has anybody seen this meme going around with Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger's two sons? Yes. Isn't it amazing to see that the son that was raised by Arnold is fit and the one that was raised by his mother is fat? All right. Two, without the father, there's a twice as likely to be obese. Next, third chapter, third and final chapter, feminism and the rise of nice guys. So this is now, I mean, we went big picture, right? Adam, v, Adam, Adam and Eve, we talked about cultural Marxism, we talked about feminism, but now we're getting closer to you guys and, and what this actually ends up looking like in the lives of basic men. Uh, next. Interse intersectional feminism, right? So today's radical feminism has morphed into a monster called intersectional feminism. So this is radical feminism. This brand of feminism seeks to incorporate feminism into the civil rights movement by, by creating a type of oppression hierarchy where some feminists are more oppressed than others based on their gender, race, or ethnicity, class and ability or disability. Thus, a black male feminist may be considered more oppressed than a rich white female feminist, especially if that black male feminist is disabled. Next. Black Lives Matter organization. 
Now, black lives do matter, of course. I'm half black, so at least half of my life matters. <laughs> what we know about Black Lives Matter is that it's not about justice for black men at all. In fact, the organization is explicitly and fundamentally against black men. I mean, it's run by these feminist lesbian women. They want nothing to do with black men. I'm going to read now from their website, their about page. I copied this down about a month ago. Since then, they've changed it, obviously, because showing your cards sometimes isn't so good, especially if you show them too quick. I couldn't believe how blatantly they were showing their cards so quickly, but I guess we're there, where they no longer have to hide. The cultural Marxism does not have to hide anymore. It's very obvious what's going on, and they're, making, they're explicit about it. And here's what they say on their website. We disrupt the prescribed nuclear family structure. Right there by supporting each other as extended families or villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. Where are the fathers? If these women are so interested in, about, in the lives of black men, they would recognize that not having a father in the home is, a part of the, is the main reason why there's so much chaos. There's so much death and destruction. They want nothing to do with the core issue. They want nothing to do with the solution. They're stirs of sedition and chaos. Continue. They say, oh, no, they say we're a, we foster a queer affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking. Chaos, disruption destroying the culture from its most basic foundation. This is not right, but it's where we are. Next. BLM is radical feminism, and it's, no, it's not hidden at all. You heard the objective of cultural Marxism. This woman, who was a co-founder, Calls herself a trained Marxist. Next. BLM is from hell. Co-founder discusses groups' occult practices invoking spirits. African ancestral worship. Okay. Next. So this is, this is the result of intersectional feminism. This is how chaotic it has become. This is how backwards we have become. This is how we've been done, ended up. This is the extreme end of Gramsci and Lucas's work in the 1930s. We're here. The result of radical feminism. Um, 2020 has allowed radical feminism to show its true colors, reveal its true motives, and unfold its satanic plan to create chaos and havoc in America under the guise of social justice. It's a lie. If there, was, if there has been any doubt about the intentions of Marxism, socialism, and feminism, it should now be very clear. Next. If we go back to feminism, or we go back to the Frankfurt School, you'll notice that um, the stated objectives of the Frankfurt School, feminism seems to encourage each one of them. It's supposed to, that's the point. I've highlighted the ones that are most obvious the creation of racism offenses, intersexual feminism. You gotta pin everybody against everybody else and create as many different factions and, uh, and, and complaints as you possibly can. That's what it does, that's what critical theory does, that's what its point is. Continual change to create confusion. Once again, how many genders do we have? Feminism. The teaching of sex and homosexuality to children, feminism. The undermining of schools, teachers, and authority, that's sort of neutral, but if you consider the father authority, feminism. Huge immigration to destroy identity, feminism. The promotion of excessive drinking, at least in women. I saw a meme the other day that said, um, women today will, will drink like your father, but they can't cook like your mother. <laughs> Emptying of churches, feminism. An unreliable legal system. And the MTM churches, when I say feminism, the church is totally effeminate. 
from the Catholic churches right through every single, pretty much every uh, denomination. The unreliable legal system, if you think about divorce rape, divorce courts, totally unreliable, feminism. Dependency on the state and state benefits, welfare, feminism. Control and dumbing down of, Ameri of the, uh, the media in America, just watch. How is it the Ghostbusters are all, all, all of a sudden women? Why is every superhero a woman now? It's, it's laughable. It's like men, have, men are weaker now, and we need women to save us. Feminism. Encourage, encouraging the breakdown of the family, obviously. Feminism. Next. Now, you got to understand here that I'm not picking on women at all. i got three daughters. I've been married to my wife for 18 years. We've been together since we were, 20, since we were 14 years old. I love women. But you got to understand this has to be pointed out because you got to point evil out when evil is present. It doesn't matter who feelings you hurt as a result. A big part of the problem with cultural Marxism in our culture right now is that, that political correctness has got us all biting our lip. we got to call it like it is. And the fact is, feminism hurts women also. Pulling from Greg Adams' book, The Evolution, Feminiz Feminism's Reverse Engineering of the American Woman, 60 million abortions, abortions since 1973. Abortion is baby killing. If you call it what it is, you start to think about it the way you should think about it. It's pure, straight up baby murder. I don't care how you twist it, what kind of special terms you give to it, it's women killing babies in the womb. And it's a evil, evil practice. 52% of women are single. Well, what does that mean? 25% of them are on mental health medication. 45% of American children are born to unwed mothers. 67% married, uh, of marriages end in divorce, and 80% of the divorces are initiated by women. 93% of alimony is paid from men to women, and 83% of women receive primary custody of their children. If you're a woman and you're listening to that, you might say, wow, that sounds great, but check this out. 72% of the inmates in state prisons were raised by single mothers. You're not doing a good job by yourself. You weren't meant to do a good job by yourself. You need us. Next. Nice guy syndrome. This is the, man, this is the man's reaction to feminism because we've basically taken it in the butt. Nice guy syndrome is the sad reaction uh, to feminism by the modern emasculated man. In order to elaborate, I'm going to read a few pages from a chapter one in the Iron John book about men. During the 60s, another sort of man appeared. The feminist movement encouraged men to actually look at women, forcing them to become conscious of concerns and sufferings that the 50 male labored to avoid. As men began to examine women's history and women's sensibility, some men began to notice that there was a female side within them and started paying attention to it. This process continues to this day, and I would say that most contemporary men are involved with it in some way. There's something wonderful about this development, and yet I have the sense that there's something wrong. The male in the past 20 years has become more thoughtful and gentle, but by this process, he's not become more free. He's a nice boy who pleases not only his mother, but also the young woman he's living with. In the 70s, I began to see all over the country a phenomenon we might call the soft male. Sometimes, even today, when I look out at an audience, perhaps half the young male are what I would call soft. They're lovable, valuable people. I like them. There's a gentle attitude towards life in them and their whole being. But many of them are not happy. You quickly notice the lack of energy in them. They are life-preserving, but not exactly life-giving. Ironically, you often see these men with strong women who positively radiate energy. The strong or life-giving woman who graduated from the 60s, so to speak, or who have inherited an older spirit, play an important role in producing this life-preserving but not life-giving man. I first learned about the anguish of soft men when they told their stories in early men's gatherings. When the younger men spoke, it was not uncommon for them to be weeping within five minutes. The amount of grief and anguish in these younger men was astounding. Grief flowed from their trouble in their marriages and their relationships. They had learned to be receptive, 
but receptivity wasn't enough to carry their marriages through troubled times. In every relationship, something fierce is needed once in a while. Both the man and the woman need to have it. But at the point when it was most needed, often the young man came up short. He was nurturing, but something else was required for his relationship and for his life. The soft male was able to say, I can feel your pain, and I will take care of you and comfort you. But he was not able to say what he wanted and stick by it. Resolve of that kind was a very different matter. So as we wrap up part one of my talk here with our focus on what has become of men in the last 60 years or so, now we've grown weak, I'm going to pull some insights from the book No More Mr. Nice Guy by Robert Glover. Next. And, uh, and here, here's a list from his book of characteristics of nice guys. Maybe you could see some part of yourself in this. Soft. Nice guys are givers. Nice guys fix and caretake. Nice guys seek approval. Nice guys avoid conflict. Nice guys hide their flaws. Nice guys repress their feelings. Nice guys try to be different than their fathers. Nice guys are more comfortable relating to women. Nice guys don't make their needs a priority. Nice guys make their partner their emotional center. Next. What's wrong with being a nice guy? Nice guys are dishonest. They're hiding themselves. They're not being true. They're biting their tongue. Nice guys are secretive, keeping their true intentions or their true feelings to themselves. Nice guys are compartmentalized. They're fractured. Nice guys are manipulative. Nice guys are controlling, because when you can't control yourself, you got to control everyone else. Nice guys give to get manipulation. Nice guys are passive aggressive. Nice guys are full of rage because you could only hold it in and bottle it up for so long. Nice guys don't set boundaries. Nice guys feel isolated. Nice guys attract needy people because it makes them feel important. And when we talk about the dark mother in my next uh, talk, you'll realize that that has been orchestrated mommy boy that has been created. Nice guys have intimacy problems. Nice guys have sexuality issues. And the final one is a quote from my father, Edmund Hulse, nice guys finish last. He's always tell me that. Next. Uh, actually, let's go back, if, you'd will, if you're willing. Um, so effeminacy and nice guys syndrome are a great problem today. Nice guys don't fight back. They keep their mouths shut and they allow themselves to be trampled on and seek approval over righteousness. Nice guys are the byproduct and enablers of everything evil in society today. In the next turn of the journey, nice guys will be wiped out completely. But we have to thank them because nice guys are ushering in the hard times which will be the catalyst for a new generation of strong men. If you are a nice guy, don't worry. There's nothing to do. You'll either be forced to change or you'll die. But if you'd like to dig deeper into your soft core and usher forth any remnant of strength lying deep within, stick around. The remainder of my talks this weekend will show you how. Next. So just to recap, we began with the predictable pattern of male effeminacy. We saw how it is ever-present, omnipotent within us and always has and will be. Doesn't mean that we gotta slide down that road. In fact, when things start getting hard, that's when the remnant will rise. And so if you're becoming a strong man, if you are a strong man, if you wanna be a strong man, we need you. We're going to desperately need you. Someone asked me during my, I, I did this presentation yesterday on one of my live calls, said, um, you know, what, what about women who, you know, they reject us in that way? Well, guaranteed when shit hits the fan, women will very quickly recognize their place. There will be no question because they will require what? Strong men to do the providing, to do the protecting because the make-believe, uh, disintegrated, demoralized world that we live in right now, which is so fake. We live in such a fake world. Everything's so fake. It's made up. 
Stephen Arnio says in his book, uh, Hard Times Create Strong Men, that when times are good, everybody wants mommy in charge. And I got kids, so I recognize that. Times are good, everybody wants mommy in charge. Everything's okay, mommy. Everybody looks to mommy. When times are bad, when there's a crisis in the home, when there's something go hard going on, everybody turns to daddy to fix it. You'll recognize this in your own home, as I do, and we'll recognize it as a society. And then finally, my last, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, my second was, I talked about the cultural collapse or the causes of uh, class masculinity. We spoke about ideological subversion, the great brainwashing that has been going on over the past 70 plus years. We talked about cultural Marxism and its plan to destroy the West, destroy, all, take over the entire world, really, but it doesn't do it with bombs and bullets. It does it with media, through Hollywood, through the music. The music is, is horrible. It destroys us. It does it through all the institutions, as Gramsci said, the long march to the institutions, destroy the schools, and the schools are destroyed. Destroy the schools, destroy the churches, destroy the media, so on and so forth. So we see that we've taken it, hook, line, and sinker. Big part of the reason why we're effeminate. I would also add to that the tremendous amount of pollution that has our testosterone levels dropping. And then feminism as the, and, and then intersectional feminism or radical feminism as the long arm of this subversion, the long arm of cultural Marxism and how it has created a generation of nice guys where we're all really suffering and the whole world is suffering in a myriad of different ways. Next. And so that's it. That's my talk. Thank you for sticking around and listening to me as I read from my notes. First time doing something like that. I'm usually a lot more animated out behind the thing. But uh, I'll stick around for the next 10 minutes. If you guys got any questions about anything I said there. Thank you. Listen, man, we are at a crossroads. Crossroads. Times are getting tough because we are growing weak. And it is not your fault. Like I said, this has been a great brainwashing. You've got to question everything you've been told. Everything that you hear in the media, Hollywood, the music, the schools, question it all. Open your mouths. Political correctness is cultural Marxism. And the point of cultural Marxism, its end game, is to disintegrate the society. It's to destroy you. When you're being politically correct, you're putting a gun to your head. Recognize that. that it's, and when I mentioned, when I spoke about Yuri Bezmenov, he says that the great brainwashing is even better than they thought it would be because it's Americans doing it to Americans. It's us doing it to one another. Every time you shut your mouth up, every time you sit down, every time you don't stand up for the right thing, or even consider that most of the shit that we've been told is completely garbage, you're putting a gun to your own head. We're not going to survive. And so through this, it's my conviction and my intention to raise up whatever remnant is left in the generation that we're currently living through with regard to men. We've got to grow stronger. Otherwise, you saw the 100 million people die in the past 100 years. We're going to very calmly, easily tuck our tails under and march off to our demise, get on those trains as they take us to concentration camps. In the same way that nobody questions anything about what's going on in the streets or with this virus these days, you're not going to ask any questions when they ask you to go into the gas chamber. You become way too soft, man. So, of course, I got a lot to say about that, but once again, I'm open. They called me Yo Elliot for 10 years on YouTube. People ask me questions. That's how I became who I am. I like answering questions to make something up. Yes, sir. I don't care what you do as long as I can hear you.
Man, standing back there and trying to read is tough. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. Uh, before I ask a question, would it be possible to go back to that um, good ties make uh, good ties weak man chart real quick? That chart? Yeah. Well, if it's possible, if not, it's not. Okay. Because he's it's gonna fine. have to like. I don't have a clicker. Okay, you cool. So, um, oh. Awesome. All right. Well, you could slide up there. I guess he's got it. You know, let's slide down a little bit further. There, right there, right in the middle. Okay, cool. All right. Perfect. Um, the reason why I want to ask, particularly that you know that chart is that um, when I saw that it 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 really hit me hard because um, um, I feel I can personally relate to that because uh, uh, what you call it. Before I ask you a question, I kind of want to, you know, uh, kind of want yeah, to reflect, do it. bro. Yeah, reflect, bro. Why I put it up there? Hopefully, so, uh, everything uh, that I said here just gave you guys something to think about, man. Right. So, I, I, um, I guess I was, I, be, I wasn't, in, you know, four year, four years relationship. At that, um, beat, I feel like it kind of opened me, you know, when I saw that. It, it, it really opened my eyes in a way that um, it really did make me. It, it, re it really softened me. In, in, in a lot of ways, which led, which led me to being an extra, extra nice guy. Yeah. So I guess my question is, I mean, I don't always, I mean, it's, it, I feel it's facts that, you know, hard times really does make you stronger, but I don't always want to be in the hard times either, you know? So I guess my question is, what would you recommend, or if it's too broad, um, if you could just give me kind of an example. I don't like recommend you, anything. You gotta understand that this is an archetype. This is a pattern. This is built in. It's going to happen. Okay. And you're gonna do this. Right. You're gonna do it over and over in your life. Right. We're gonna do it over and over in civilization. The key here is awareness. Okay. You gotta just be able to know because if you don't know and things start getting hard, right? Right. Rather than recognizing, oh, this is the time for me to get strong, you're gonna say, oh, I'm gonna crumble and die. But if you recognize the archetype, you recognize the pattern, you can say, oh, I see what's coming. It just gives you foresight. That's all. Okay. So uh, yeah, that's that. Uh, that's my question. Like, how do you stay balanced? It's or, or what would you recommend to stay balanced? You just don't be stay awareness. balanced. Just be awareness. Just okay. like riding a bike, you know, you stay balanced okay. by just recognizing that you're okay. off balance. Gotcha. Recognizing that this is what it is, and it will always be what it is. Okay. And you just got to be able to see it. Awareness is transformative in and of itself. Okay. You don't have to do anything about it, but you need to know about it. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. You'll know what to do when it's time to do it. Okay. Don't try to do it before it's time to do it. Got it. The fact is that you recognize that it's coming, you'll be able to face it. Okay. Most people are fucking blindsided by this stuff. Right, right, yeah, okay. That, yeah, that kind of answers my question. I use myself, for example. My life got, I mean, I, it was hard. Children, a family, trying to grow a business, bankruptcy, losing my house, whole lot of shit. Okay. Things got easy. And I got soft. Right, right. That's like what happened right? to me. Yeah. I recognize it in myself, but I know it ain't going to stay that way. Right. It can't stay that way. No, it did not. And so I always prepare for when shit hits the fan again. You see what I'm saying? I'm okay. always just watching. Gotcha. That's it. Just you got to stay aware. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. You got it, bro. That's all the time we have. Give it up more time for Elliot Hulse. talking to Mr. Elliot Hulse. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, as always. And I think one of the best speakers we've ever had at this convention in our entire 14-year history. Without further ado, please let me welcome back to the 21 convention stage, Elliot Hulse! Thank you, sir. Good night, dude. Elliot Hulse is a father, a husband, and a man. A man who inspires men, a man who helps men be good at being men. And today, he's gonna help you become a better patriarch and set yourself up for success. So let's give it up for Elliot Hulse. Thanks, bro. Patriarchy is the future. He actually has over two million followers. He's one of the biggest YouTubers in Florida and the United States, around the world. 
an amazing man, a strong man, or a strong father. Anyway, without further ado, please let me welcome for the first time ever to the 22 convention stage, Elliot Hulse. Thank you, sir. Thanks, buddy. One last point that I want to make that was really what broke my heart was to discover that feminism, which sound to most people in our world like some sort of a good thing, a progressive thing, uh, ultimately is the agenda is to break down the family, destroy the family. It's the stated purpose of feminism. And so in a world where men are weak because there's no fathers, families are being destroyed, it really seems like feminism is the long arm of this movement to destroy our world.